Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Mutzker, the Director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wineskins. Thank you for joining us for another episode of New Wine Tastings. And as you may recall, if you've been watching previous episodes, we're doing a series on medical ethics, namely a personalist approach to medical ethics with Dr. Robert Potter, a doctor of medicine and also a doctorate of philosophy in the domain of religion, ethics, and psychology. Uh, from the University of Chicago, and then I believe your uh, doctorate in medicine is uh, at the University of Kansas Medical School. Is that correct? Right. And by the way, I, I often like to draw attention to the selection of bow ties. Uh, it's a very distinguishing yeah. mark. Uh, so, Robert, the tie today is from where you were just sharing with th this with me a few minutes ago. The the tie is the official tie of the American College of Physicians. The American College of Physicians is the organization of internists, general internists, and cardiologists, and things like that, who, who work together. And green is our color, and this is our official tie. <laughs> That's very good. Um, so I, I love I, the I color. Just, when, I, when I was, I, when I was uh, inducted as a, as a fellow of the American College of Physicians, that's a, that's a considerable honor, and I appreciate that. Well, it is. It is. And uh, it's not everyone who uh, has a fellowship uh, in any uh, discipline or domain and with a bow tie to go with it. So, uh, so thank you. So again, thank you, Dr. Potter, for joining me once again for this series of new wine tastings on a personalist approach to medical ethics. In this episode, I want to engage what we might call bedside manners mm -hmm. <laughs> for medical professionals, patients, and the people advocating for them. A personalist approach with its emphasis on clinical precision and empathic care requires that we find quote unquote fitting, we'll come back to that, fitting words and the fitting tone to communicate effectively. And of course, I'm picking up on H. Richard Niebuhr's uh, theme or wording of the fitting response, which we had talked about in a previous episode with you related to his three cardinal questions. Uh, what is the fitting response, for example? In other words, it is not enough to know important information and to advocate for one's important others. One also has to know how to communicate it. And this is something I am working on 24 seven, as you know, uh, Dr. Potter, in terms of my own son's situation. I want to be a good advocate for my son, and that includes understanding the medical language. It includes, uh, you know, certainly keen interest and constancy. It also requires that I learn how to be engaged with what my friend and your friend, Pastor Tom Scheib, might call and would call emotional intelligence. Not easy to have intellectual intelligence and emotional intelligence. And I don't have the bow ties to convey that uh, I'm good at either. So, uh, but that said, that said. Um, so as you reflect upon what you said several episodes ago regarding the fitting response, how would you encourage the medical community on the one hand and patients, their family members and friends on the other hand to engage one another? And uh, before you answer that, I just wanna say this. For example, I have found that medical professionals sometimes use English terms, but infuse them with new meaning. I've been bewildered at times and had no idea that such infusion was going on until you enlightened me. What can medical professionals do to make sure patients and their loved ones understand what is being communicated on vital healthcare matters? That's part of that work that we have for communication and bedside manners and the like. So if you wish to speak to any of that to start out with, that would be wonderful. Yes, well, you know, my, my first in reflection is to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you the way I would talk to the um, second year medical students. Okay. In the first year of medical school, you really are learning some physiology and anatomy and histology and chemist, biochemistry and so on. You don't see patients, you don't even think about them. But in that second year, You've got to decide just how well you're going to communicate with people because that's going to be mm -hmm. your life's work is communication unless you're a pathologist and deal only with little pieces of humans or dead humans or however you're going to be talking to people communication is at the core 
of what medicine is as a moral enterprise. Mm. And I always teach the students, say, remember three E's. You're talking about exploration, explanation. I never could come up with a good third E, so I always said execution, which sounds a little crude, but I'll tell you what that is. <laughs> so exploration, uh, explanation, and execution. Now, what that is, it's a hidden of the three steps that I've given that I learned from uh, Niebuhr. What's mm -hmm. going on here? You know, I'm going to explore the situation. Mm -hmm. you know, explore the situation. Find out what's going on. And secondly, then, work towards an explanation of what's going on by sorting out the values and, and what direction this, this ought to go or will go as, as we see it uh, uh, play it, the illness of the injury play itself out. And finally, to execute is to do something, mm -hmm. to execute the plan. So it's sort of a disguised way of the, the three E's mm -hmm. of exploration and exp uh, explanation and execution. You can preach that, you know, you can preach that, the three yeah, E's. Yeah, well, it, it's it, a it, Sunday morning it, sermon. And some, and some people will remember it, actually. <laughs> That's uh, right. Well, you know, the other thing related to that is that um, what we're really trying to do is to be sure that I understand the other person mm. and to be as sure as possible that they understand me. I mean, that, that to me is the simplest way to think about communication. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I've got to do. I got to be sure that I'm understanding what somebody's telling me. And, and then finally that, that they understand what I'm telling them. And that's my job as a communicator. And you said that's part of ethics. Well, I think at the core, it's at the core of ethics. You and I, do I don't that. think a lot of I don't think a lot of people think that that's part of ethics. No, well, eth to some people, ethics is all this philosophical mumbo jumbo that sort of figure out what's right or what's good or what's what 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 we ought to do today. It, no, I, I it, that, that's involved, of course. But really, what's going on is just what Niebuhr laid it out. You got to find out what's going on here then figure out what uh, values are going to tell us what direction to go in and then find a way to go there. Mm -hmm. And then, and so that's how I, I say ethics is good reasons for action. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the rawest definition I continue to use. I've used it before in our interviews here. Ethics are, are good reasons for action. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're searching for. And, uh, you know, the, the, the first point here about finding out what's going on in the situation from the medical point of view, that, that's, that all rubs down to what we call taking a history, mm -hmm. you know, talking to it. Rather than, rather than taking a history, I, 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 re, I repelled against that phrase. I always talked about listening to the voice of the patient. That to me is a more sensitive way to talk about that first stage where you're listening to what's going on in the life of the patient. Some patients, you know, are really find it difficult to talk to a doc, mm. you know, they, uh, and, and families as well. Whenever I say patient, patient, I'm also referring to family members because sometimes the patient is not able to communicate but the family is is in mm -hmm. the communication route here in the dialogue you know and so i i've tried to figure out ways to go about doing that and, and uh, i can remember an, an instance where um this one little lady was so timid i said well okay write me a story write a little story just just write it down and, and and then you can read it to me or I'll read it out loud to you and you can you can add to and correct as we go along. She did a good job, you know, of telling me what, what her symptoms were and what she felt like was going on with her. You know, we learned a long time ago, you listen to the voice of the patient and about 85% of the time, they'll tell you what's wrong with them during the interview, that first mm -hmm. the, the listening to what's going on, you, you're going you're gonna to come to it. You know, I saw a study once years ago that was just fascinating to me. It compared the number of questions that an experienced physician need to ask to reach a diagnosis. 
as compared to an inexperienced, mm -hmm. a beginning student in medicine. A and it was about 25 questions for the inexperienced, and it got down to five questions for the experienced. Now that sounds like good, but I found times when that was a flaw in communication. Mm -hmm. Because I, the doc, at five questions, say, I've got all the information I need. I'm not interested in what else they have to say to me. That's not good. So as doc and as teaching other docs, I say, not only listen to what else they have to say, even though it's beyond what you, quote, need to make the diagnosis, listen to them. Not only listen to everything they say and ask questions about it, be clear about it, but particularly, pay attention to the last thing they tell you just before they walk out of the exam room. More than once, I've discovered that that was the clue to what was going wrong in their life. Mm. The last thing, they just finally got the courage to say it just before our interview ended. That reminds me of my late mother who, you know, she would call and we'd have a long talk and right when we would go to part company for that particular call, she would say, oh, by the way, and that was, and that was the thing, oh my goodness, that was the thing we needed to focus on. And, and then I, my blood pressure went through the roof because it's like, no, I need to count for that. But we ran out of time. Um, I think it's, it's also a matter, isn't it? That, you know, I, I think sometimes with medical professionals, and I face this as a theologian too, there's so many things you wanna to communicate to patients and their families. And it's like, we can go through the list and we say, well, let's talk, but then we never give them a chance to, to ask questions or share what they want. And I think sometimes those who have so much confidence or apparent confidence uh, may not create enough space for others to really speak in. And I think that's your point about the five versus the 25 question. Right, and it's also more difficult if I'm dealing with a family because it, some member of the family is gonna be the talkative one, the, the one who steps up first, you know. And, and I, I gotta be sure that I've asked everyone in the room yeah. if they had something more that they wanted to contribute. Yeah. The other then, thing that I want to yeah. emphasize before we leave this first section about exploration of what's going on. You know, I said that I really want to be sure that that I understand what others are telling me. And I want them to understand what I'm telling them. So here we are in this first section trying to figure out what is the situation. I would say to them. This is the way I understand you're talking to me. And try to repeat it, you see, try to get it clear about it. Then I would say, now, you tell me what you've heard me say to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's I, key. Used pull, I used to pull another trick on that, a kind of a variation on that. Somebody would, um, I'd, you know, give them some instructions about what I'd what I thought was going on, and this is the medicine we're going to use, and come back in two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. I said, now, you're going to go home, and you're going to call your sister. And your sister's going to say, what did the doc say to you? You tell me what you're going to tell her. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> That's good. It was just a little, little variation on that thing. And it would often work. The, 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 the patients would stumble and say, oh, oh well, did I forget something? Well, yes, you did. You know, there was an important feature there. I gave you that number and you repeated it and then you're way, way off, you know. So it was a way to rehearse an agreement as we try to come to an agreement as yeah. to what we think is going on here. Yeah. You know, and that's why Niebuhr was so insistent on that first step. If you can't agree on what is happening what's going on who did what uh, you know wh what what's the number wh what what did somebody see yesterday as compared to today if you don't have the data if you don't have the information the evidence to start off with you know the conversation's going to go screwy no matter how you do with it and that again uh, really helpful very helpful and 
you know from my conversations with you about my son's situation that I will hit the pause button with doctors and say, I'd like to share um, how we're processing this uh, mm -hmm. based on conversations with you and your colleagues. Yeah. And I'll say, what are your thoughts based on what I've said? Or to ask them for clarification, can I, can I reiterate what I've heard you say and feel free to correct me? I think sometimes the doctor's not going to ask the question that you asked or uh, say to the, the family member or the patient. So what are you gonna say to that other family member? So for me, as the patient's family member, I need to, in a sense, be proactive and say to the doc, how do I um, assess what you're saying? Or can I reiterate what I've heard you say? And hopefully the doctor has enough personal sense to say, sure. And they, they create that space for you to do so. I, and I think you've resonated with that approach. Would, would you care to comment? Yeah, I think absolutely that, that, that that's essential to do. I guess my comment would just uh, would just lead me into um, a little reminiscence on what I mean by explanation, because you know once we've sort of agreed what the information is, it is what is the situation. After you and I have clarified that in our conversation, I owe you what I believe to be an explanation of the situation. Mm. Now, here's where there's a problem. You and I, say you're the patient, I, I'm the doc. You and I know some things together. We can lay them all out. We can lay the facts out. We can lay the information out and we can agree on that. I can even give you a fairly um, coherent explanation of how your situation came to be. You see, and the, and the dynamic factors that are working in that situation. I could give you a cogent explanation of that. And that would be very helpful. And you and I can, can uh, say, we know that together. The problem is the doc thinks he knows a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. And he may not be telling you. You know, we sometimes have to um, make a judgment as to what we're going to filter out of what we do know. Um, and, and sometimes we even have to pretend like we know things that we don't know. Uh, <laughs> I used to joke with my patients, maybe, I mean, my student, maybe I, maybe I mentioned this in one of the other interviews. I get to, you know, I'm at the age now and, and having uh, taught this for uh, 60 years. I, I get a little confused about what I just said, or if I just said that a little bit ago. But I used to say to the patient, to the student, now, if you ask a question, give them an answer. Even if you don't know what the answer is, make it up. You're educated. You ought to be able to make up all kinds of answers. Then go check it out. If you're pretty close to the right answer, leave it alone. If you're way off, go back and apologize and start over. I've uh, had to do that a time or two. I remember a particular case in which, uh, uh, this was back in the days when we took people into the hospital for two or three days, you know, to do their gallbladder study and their upper GI and their colonoscopy and whatnot, to kind of check them out. We don't do that anymore. But on the third day of this lady's hospitalization, I dashed up to her room and said, Joe, your gallbladder's just fine. Looks good. Well, after she was, was sat packing her suitcase and getting ready to go home, I looked at her chart. She had a gallbladder full of stones. Mm -hmm. What did I do? Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do, Paul? Just sort of suck it up and forget it? No. <laughs> I had to go back and apologize to her. And, and, and I gave her some lame excuse like, Oh, I was in a hurry and I just failed to look at that. But, but none of the excuses were adequate. Docs have to do that sometimes. Docs have to have the humility. And that, that to me is right at the core of good communication. Yeah. 
Well, just on that point, the humility oh. to, to realize that you don't know or that you've made a mistake or that you've said the wrong thing or that you heard it wrong from somebody else. There, there are lots of ways to, to make humility be the guiding principle of communication. And with that, I think it's really important, like in any in any discipline, that those who are in the position as the authority realize how much power they wield. Uh, they, we may not be aware of that, but it's so important that we are aware. So if if a doctor, for example, doesn't demonstrate humility, but rather defensiveness, mm -hmm. that gets really dangerous yeah. because you, you don't even know what you can say because your family member, for example, or yourself, whatever the case might be, is, is not going to be in a good position if you challenge in some manner or, or ask for clarity, um, so on and so forth. So I've always appreciated in my experience, especially with my son, when I've seen someone who's an authority, and you've been in some of those conversations as a fellow authority in the medical field, where one had said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I should have done this, or I, I think I should have reached out prior to you. Yeah. Boy, that, that didn't cause me to lose respect for them. I, I, th that person gained respect in my eyes. Yeah. Or a surgeon who said, well, here are the dynamics. Here's what we do know. Here's what we don't know. Yeah. I thought, well, I know you don't know everything. So I'm, I was kind of encouraged to know that they knew that too. But that... Uh, uh, wait a minute. Who, who told you we don't know everything? <laughs> God. But uh, oh, 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 okay. All right. the, master, the master physician. No, but, uh, but you know, still that, that idea, it, I think it can be very welcoming. It, it doesn't always create insecurity. If a doctor says, I don't know about everything, well, then you know you've got a problem. Yeah, but you uh, know, I, I often think about that, 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 that if, some, if a doc says to me, I don't know, I, I, I ask myself three questions. Does he not know because it's not knowable? Yeah. Does he not know because he hadn't looked it up, he hadn't checked? Or does he not know because he's not interested? Huh. You know, I, and um, I, mm. got, I always have to sort those out, Paul. Yeah. You know, and 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 if it's not knowable, you know, you 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 that's where you really respect the doc yeah. or anybody in, in authority, anybody who's got power, when they say no, it's just not knowable. Yeah. Or you could even respect them and said, you know, I didn't study that. That's not part of my professional uh, knowledge. Uh, that's not something that um, a, a person in my particular specialty uh, knows about. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why a person might not know something because they haven't checked up on it. If they don't know it because they failed to look at the chart, like I did with that lady with the gallbladder, you know, you need to slap on the wrist at least. It's the person who doesn't know because they're not interested. That's the dangerous one. Yeah. That's the one that you have to be on the lookout for. You almost have to suspect anybody who says, I don't know, that they don't know because they're not interested. And, and you don't want to just challenge them right off about that. But I think that there's got to be a, a, a real intense kind of curiosity to answer that question. Do they not know because they're not interested? Because that to me, is a sign that this person needs to be watched very carefully. And in my experience, I I have antennae up uh, all the time. It it can get exhausting, but uh, I watch for that by way of if is someone proactive, mm -hmm. is okay. someone seeking to go the extra mile, mm -hmm. even how do they connect with the patient or the patient family member when they walk in the room. I think of one respiratory therapist, for example, who is very winsome, uh, always inquiring, do you have any questions? Um, and is there to even do more, not outside of what they could do, but even to check on things that they might know about um, to at least offer some initial input, even though they'll defer. I take that very seriously. Whereas those who are always only willing to answer 
uh, either when they want to or, or or if they feel like that's just in their narrow limits of concern and never want to really connect with you, that that can say other things. And so I think the person who's willing to go the extra mile and is always inquiring about anything we can do is is an indication of someone who's interested to begin with. And so that I think is very insightful. Very insightful indeed, yes. Thank you. And now let's turn it around toward the patient. Now, people are probably surprised. I'm always surprised when you say, oh, I had to go see the dentist or I, I had a, a, a checkup. I mean, don't you just check yourself? I mean, you're a doctor and uh, <laughs> don't you just use the mirror, <laughs> uh, get your stethoscope out. But patients, loved ones, and you're a patient sometime and you're a patient's loved one, you know, it's not just the doctor. Uh, we all need to be careful to guard against sweeping accusations and judgments, but address specific concerns to medical professionals. Instead of saying to this or that doctor or about this or that doctor, or <laughs> just saying this doctor's a quack, or that hospital or care facility is poor in quality, or make demands that are totally unrealistic, that that's not according to industry, not even close, um, it is best to address concrete items and ask what can be done to improve conditions and care in a way that is befitting what is normal practice. I think that's where we have to go. So if need be, one can always seek a second opinion on something, and I had to do that just very recently. Could you uh, please expand on these points? Well, I think what, what I'm hearing you say, Paul, is that um, if you're at a point in your own care or the care of a loved one where you are not confident that the physician that you are working with has thoroughly examined your situation and has a complete and plausible explanation of what your situation is and has a therapeutic solution that fits the situation, back to the fitting. I, I think it is, um, I think it's justifiable to walk out of the room, so to speak, you know, and, and not go any further. If you do not have a sense of trust that this person before you is knowledgeable enough, honest enough, thoughtful enough, interested in you enough for you to feel comfortable with them, that they, they have your trust, mm -hmm. you ought not to be um, work dealing with them. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way with the mechanic who's uh, you know dealing with my, the engine in my car. But, but I think when it comes to uh, how we um, understand and treat our, our, ourselves, I think it's essential. And, and so the seeking of a second opinion is, is sometimes a tricky thing. Um, well, Doc, um, you know, I respect the fact that, that, that you've been seeing me now for two or three years and that we've been dealing with this problem. But, you know, from my uh, thinking through it, uh, it seems to me like there might be some other ways to approach this that we haven't really worked through together adequately. I, I would feel uh, better if we had um, another opinion here. It's sort of like, you know, getting a second bid on the, on the roof in my house. Now that for the, on the one hand, that's thought to be about money, but it's not just about money. It's about how do you feel about the roofer who's come to your door, mm -hmm. you know, and, and wh whether you, you trust him to be an honest man and put the shingles on right, you know? Um, so I, 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 I hate to say that I don't trust you. It's not that I don't trust you is that the trust is not at a high enough level to feel like we have together explored all that's possible to explore. See, all, everything I've said is the things I hear you saying that you're trying to use in your situation, where you're really saying, I don't trust you enough. I trust you, but not enough to make a decision here, or not enough to just go with where you are. I, I, want, I want a fuller, thoughtful uh, evaluation of this situation. And I, you know, 
any physician that's worth their salt ought not to rebel against that. You know, if they, if they would simply listen to the voice of the patient, approach this empathically, and realize that here's a person in front of you who has not yet developed the kind of trust necessary for them to follow your instructions. So it's, it, it, you, you, you must, you need to, you're required to, you know, find an alternative uh, a colleague that, to, to send them to for another opinion. Uh, or, or when you're dealing with a facility where you've got the opinion of one person of power, you might ask to get, you know, a, a two or three other people engaged here and, and see if, if everybody on the team together is trustworthy. Yes. You know, it may be that one of the team is not all that trustworthy in your opinion, but the, as a whole, the team is trustworthy. I mean, that, that's that's very possible too, particularly when you're dealing with with a, a facility that's got uh, three, four, or five people doing different things, different aspects of care, rehabilitation and skin care and uh, gastrointestinal, et cetera, et cetera. You know, getting everybody together. And and by the way, you know, that's one of the flaws of modern medicine, or the one of the flaws that we let happen in complicated rehabilitation medicine. That is, we've got a whole lot of people doing their thing, and you're not confident that there's anybody really holding that team together. Right, right. You know, and, and to me, the family ought to be the one, not, not necessarily to do that, but to find out if it's being done. And what I try and do is, again, this is a patient's um, family member. Whenever I'm at a facility, uh, in this case for my son, I want to know who oversees what area. Mm -hmm. right. And so, okay, so you're overseeing this, who's overseeing this, because it's all split up. Now, if you're in a hospital situation, you often have a hospitalist. And if you're working with hospitalists, they're kind of like the jack of all trades. So if I can find someone who's like a jack of all trades person, and then also someone who's a good advocate as part of the team, that you can sound use as a sounding board, I think that helps to reduce the anxiety level as a family member. Um, but I spend a lot of time discerning who is trustworthy, who's an advocate, who's a good sounding board. And if I feel, whether it's in a hospital or in a care facility, wherever it might be, that some are better than others, without trying to make sweeping judgments, back to my earlier point, that this is a crackpot or a bunch of crackpots or horrible facility, which I see people doing all the time. That's not helpful. And that's just gonna put the walls up. People are gonna say, okay, well, we'll deal with them as little as we have to, but you're not winning people over. And as, again, Pastor Shai, a friend of ours says, you wanna make your point while not making enemies. And so I think you want to, for the sake of the patient, always try and find out who are the people of peace, who are the people of competence. And like you say, modern medicine, it's so broken up. It's like we've taken the an anatomy and it's like, okay, you cover the liver, you cover the eyeball, you cover the, the, the toenail <laughs> over here on this foot. And it gets overwhelming because people only are willing to engage. And I think, yes, everyone has specialization but we can at least try where we can possibly support to say, well, I could take the temperature here if that's appropriate, or here, let me go get someone who can take care of that for you, where they go the extra mile. Well, you've spoken it just like Dale Carnegie in his wonderful book of the 50s, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know. But in addition, I want to reemphasize you're not only looking to who is doing what, but you want to be sure that who is doing what is talking to everybody else. The that right hand and the me, left that hand. Me, that to me is a critical piece that not everybody understands. Mm -hmm. they, they, they assume that everybody's talking to one another. It is not necessarily the case. And, and so you need to find out if, if skincare is talking to rehab people, et cetera. Well, and, and with that, there are situations, again, my son's situation when he was at hospitals or currently, 
uh, at a center. And again, this I mean these as general points. I'm not speaking to specific situations, but general well, principles. You're grounding them in reality here, Paul. That, that, that's important. Yeah, and, and what I have found is that I will sometimes have to ask, um, has that been communicated? Because I'm finding that staff people aren't following through on directives. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll go back to the authority and say, thank you for your directive. I'm seeing that this isn't being, out. could you make sure this is being communicated? I've had to do that on numerous occasions over the last several months. And one has to be tenacious. One has to be polite, hopefully, you know, having the right tone, but to be keenly engaged and make sure the right hand and the left hand know what's going on. Because often, I hate to say it, but they don't. Right. And, and, and especially if you don't have someone who's central, uh, grand central or control tower, you're leaving it up to each domain. And then they think, why aren't you doing this? Well, you're not looking at the whole person. You're only looking at a part. And we have to balance out everything. Take the word, the very word, supervisor. Hmm. The big seer, the big eye, the supervisor who's looking, who's seeing it all. Yes. And is seeing to it that everyone is communicating with everyone and that everybody understands every 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 activity. Now it goes back even directly to um Niebuhr and the fitting response. You know, he, he didn't do a lot with real concrete ethics when it came to medicine. There are those of us in the in the the medical ethics field have taken Niebuhr and concretized Niebuhr into this medical field. But for him, fitting response was do what, um, do, do that action, take that action, do that strategy that will allow you to realize, actualize, bring into being that which you have valued as important to get done. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the problem is that once an action is set in motion. If one assumes the action will be carried to completion, one has failed to carry out the action. Mm -hmm. The action has to be constantly directed and redirected and monitored until the action has worked itself out to completion. And he's either achieved the goal or fail to achieve the goal. But, you know, to act on something uh, was um, what I had to learn, particularly as a physician, because let's, for instance, the, here's the way things operate. In the hospital, I write an order. That's the action. The nurses take the action and they figure out how to make the action real, how to get it done over a period of hours or days or weeks or whatever it takes to get the action to completion. If I don't check on that, and I trust the nurses completely, I guess I ought to feel good about that if I got real good nurses working with me. And so often that was the case, but I just simply was neurotic enough that I had to check, you know, and I would come back the next day, let's say, and say, now, uh, I ordered uh, 600,000 units of um, uh, procaine penicillin to be given IV at exactly two o'clock. What time was it given? Well, well, according to the records here, it was given at quarter to four. Well, what was the two hour delay about? Well, it didn't come up from pharmacy on time. Well, what, what was wrong with pharmacy? I don't know but it just didn't get up here on time. You know where I'm going? I'm going down to pharmacy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the hospital pharmacist and say, why was this order not fulfilled in, at the hour that I intended it to be ordered? Well, doc, don't be so upset, you know, it doesn't matter whether he got it at two o'clock or four o'clock. Well, it may not matter to you, but it mattered to me because I wanted that action done and you, you get my point. Oh, absolutely. You know, action, action just doesn't happen. Yeah. Action has to be done moment by moment and rechecked and redirected and looked at again and monitored and, and kept going 
action just doesn't, you just can't write it down and expect it to happen. And to your point, the um, follow through, because the key word before was assumption, that if we just assume, well, we've assumed wrongly because we have to make sure there has to be accountability for all of us. And I think that's for the doctor. It's for the patient's family member. So in my situation, you know, I have to, if I know there's a directive from the medical doctor or the nurse or therapist, first off, I need to find out what the directive is. Yeah, be, be sure you know what is the order, what is the direction, yes. And then, what is the based proposed on, action? Right, what is the directive, what is the proposed action with that directive? And then I make sure that that directive is followed through on. And, and then what I do, because I think it's important, because people can easily get defensive, especially when someone's in an authority position. Uh, people often don't take kindly to their authority being questioned, whether that's for a medical doctor, a theologian, or whatever. Um, and I think that I need to say, thank you for your directive. Now, I have found that that directive wasn't being followed through. Mm -hmm. And I say, thank you for your directive. That wasn't followed through. So I, I hold them accountable to their own authority and what they've declared themselves to be. So I think that's so important. Okay, I can't say let's, that. Let's no. stop right there. Somebody would ask me, what does that have to do with communication? Accountability mm -hmm. is feedback communication. Absolutely. You know, you know, we need to write a little paper on this, Paul, mm -hmm. that holding people accountable is at the core of communication. And ethics. It, it's, it's feedback information that, that enhances, deepens, perfects the communication. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to write that one down. That, that, uh, I'm... Well, and, and, and again, to your point, it's part of ethics. Communication, good communication good accountability is all part of ethics. And so I even, if I'm having a conversation and generally they allow me to do this, I will sometimes send summary emails uh, if, if that's permitted and say, here's what I understood from our conversation. Here's the action point I took away from it. Thank you for what you're doing, what you said you're gonna do and here's what I'm going to do. Cause you're looking for a, con a good contractual arrangement and collaborate with them where you're trying to support them and make it a better hospital, a better facility, a better rehab facility, et cetera, better hospital. Um, and I find that that often works. If they sense that you care, one, for your family member, and two, for the well being of the whole of the patients, and that they succeed, what's there not to like? And I think that's important. I think that's really important. Now, if we transition here, mm -hmm. People, um, can you can you please share a few examples, rather, of um, how you have sought to ensure good open lines of communication with patients uh, and their loved ones? Can you also share a few examples of where patients and their loved ones have been effective in communicating their concerns in concrete terms? Yeah, one just splits right up into my mind. I'd been in practice for probably four or five years, and I, I felt pretty cocky about my capacity. And uh, I had a fellow that was dying of lung cancer. And somehow he let me know that um, he had a brother who lived down only, only 50 miles down the road from Kansas City in, in Topeka, Kansas. And they haven't talked to one another for 35 years. Hmm. And um, I said, why not? Well, we just fell apart. Well, I got a hold of the brother. And he was um, disabled, couldn't drive, didn't have any way to get to Kansas City. So I went down and got him. Mm -hmm. Put those two brothers in the room together essentially said, talk it up, <laughs> or talk it out, or just talk. Yeah. And they did for two hours. Wow. And they, they felt good about that. Felt good about that. Well, you make house calls, and then you make house calls, don't oh, you? That, that, that's, a, that's an exception, Paul. I, I didn't do that very often. 
<laughs> wow. Praise God, though. I remember, I remember That's another cool. one where, where brother were, were not communicating with brother. Get this one. This fellow had, had came in and out of the hospital. He, he had congestive heart failure, you know, with swelling and shortness of breath and so on. And I, I'd, I'd tune him up and get all the swelling off of his body and his lungs were clear and he'd go home and by golly, you know, in six weeks, he'd be back again. I said, what's the problem here? Are you taking your medicine? Well, doc. Not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? Well, I was over at my brother's and we, he got, we got upset with one another. I just flushed all my medicines down the toilet. Now, I would call that poor communication. Okay. And when I discovered that his, his recurring illness was a consequence of that particular example of poor communication and others like it. You know, I, I, I finally straightened out his, his, his way of trying to communicate. His way of communicating was to show his family and his friends just how sick he could be, hmm. you know, and how they should take better care of me. That's what, that's what the communication was about. Hmm. You got to be suspicious about the way people communicate, because not all the communication is in clear language. Obviously, language is a problem. We didn't even talk much about language, when we could. But it's, you know, I, um, I, 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 I discovered a little way that I could um, be more personable in my dealing with patients in communication. And in my charts, this is back in the days when I wrote charts with a, actually with a fountain pen for years mm. and years and years till my wife began to complaining about all the ink stains in my white shirt. So I, I turned to a ballpoint, I guess. But I had what I called a dialogue box. And a person would come in here and in the conversation, I would learn that they caught a 14 pound, pound trout in northern Minnesota last summer, I wrote that down. Because the next time I saw them, I'd have that information there and I'd bring that up and they would just beam, you know? I mean, they felt, we, we just bonded so quickly because he, he, but Potter even remembers that I caught a 18 pound trout last summer. Mm. That's beautiful. It was a little bit tricky in a way, but I was also honest because little pieces of information about the other person is what makes person to person communication so rich and, 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 and makes it so possible to develop trust in one another that may not be there if, 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 if people don't, don't remember that I remember yes. anything about them. Well, and, and to that point, you know, uh, someone recently asked about what my son's interests were. Mm -hmm. um, so when they speak to him, they know what to speak to him about, even though he's not responding uh, in the way that we would normally think of with, you know, clear sentences. You know, he's, he's quiet, um, given the, the nature of the brain injury. You know, there's the hope that he's grasping something, you know, uh, that there's, but there's an interest level. We want to speak to him about matters that interest him. Uh, the music he wants has, has the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is uh, some is to some degree intact. That's where speech is located. Uh, you know, the possibility of his hearing and even comprehending is there. His capacity right now to respond is not there. So you're doing exactly what's right. Now take that example, Paul and push it into communication generally. When you are speaking to another person, when I'm speaking to another person, I know they're taking in a lot of information, but I don't know for sure how they're processing it because they're, they're just stunned. They don't know how, what they should say back to me. Hmm. So often that is the case when I've given them a fatal diagnosis, you know, or six weeks to live or whatever. 
but it, sometimes it can be even more complicated than that. When 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 I would say, now this is what you what I think you need to do to deal with this problem. The input is there, but the output, the return information back to me is not there. That's the kind of incomplete communication that we need sometimes to continue doing, because that's all there is to do. But you have to allow for that. And in the situation where I'm dealing with somebody who would have the capacity to respond at some point, the next time I see them, I need to do two things. What do you remember of our conversation last time? What can I tell you again? Maybe I'll just tell you the whole story again until we, till the way I'm explaining it becomes the way you understand it. Mm -hmm. And you can feed that back to me to assure me that you do understand it. Mm -hmm. I see, I'm just thinking about that as one of the, one of the elements of communication that when you're dealing with people with uh, limitations of whatever kind, whether that's cultural, educational, brain disorder, whatever, uh, you, you sometimes have to realize that the communication input, output, return, the dialogue is not really fully there. And that you as communicator may have to be monitoring and guiding and magnifying the, the capacity of the a communicate the whole communication because the other partner is not at a level of being able to communicate back to you you've been in that kind of situation paul e even with students who, who who have not quite comprehended what it is that you're trying to talk about in, in a classroom setting you know, and, and you say, I'm putting it in and I'm not sure they can put it back to me. I'm not mm -hmm. sure they can tell me back. So what do you do as instructor? You find ways, new ways, different ways, alternative ways to communicate to them until they either can or they fail mm -hmm. to communicate back. It, I think it's one of the, one of the most difficult parts of communication to teach. Um, up at OHSU, uh, just as I was leaving my concentration up there, it's been now five, six years since I've been really on board up there. We developed out of the, um, the uh, ethics um, department um, a, ho a whole section on communication in ethics. And uh, I, I'm just proud of the fact that up at OHSU, that program over the past five years has been highly successful, highly yeah. sought after by medical students. I cannot say that I'm proud that it's now a, a, a required course, but it's hitting a, a sizable percentage of medical students and resident physicians to give them um, the capacity to understand communication at a deeper level than um, what I saw sadly reported uh, now almost 30 years ago. Listen to this. An investigator recorded interviews by a physician mm -hmm. of a patient in their office, some 300 interviews. The average time it took before the physician interrupted the patient. You see that? Interrupted, that is broke into the conversation, broke into the communication, ruptured the communication. It took on the average 13 seconds. That to me is an indictment of physician communication. And a lot of medical schools are trying to work on that. And I give credit to OHSU, where we're trying to deal with the whole topic of communication just in the general practice of medicine. And I think it comes right out of the heart of the whole business of ethics in medicine. 
Well, and the, the whole business of ethics, wherever ethics, wherever humans are com, are engaged with one another, communication is at its core of person to person. And I'm going to tie together some uh, threads that we've been talking about over the last several weeks and uh, bring it home here to this theme of communication and ethics and accountability that we've been talking about today and also uh, frame it from the vantage point of the patient and the and the family's perspective. You've been speaking primarily uh, from the establishment of the physician and like, and I'm gonna turn it around, but again, uh, accountability, communication, ethics, uh, that middle question in Niebuhr um, that what well, you added to Niebuhr's two questions, the intermediate question that you, you found elsewhere is, what ought we to care about? Do I care about the patient? Do I care about the family member? Uh, and I think when we're breaking in to their statements, it's often a sign that either we're just really poor communicators because we're not letting them communicate, um, or we don't care in some ways about what they have to say. And so so how do I, because communication is extremely hard, and you and I are both educators, it's extremely hard, uh, you know, to try and become a good community, communicator is a lifelong task. Um, and it's a, it's a lost art in many ways, and I'm still trying to discover that art. Um, so that said, when I have someone who I'm working with who's not listening, and sometimes they mean to they mean to care. They're, they they think they have something vital to share, and I thought it was for me to share my concerns. And then they're they're filling up the whole time, telling me what I need to be corrected on, which I'm all for. But sometimes I have to show them respect, and I'm speaking as a patient's family member to show respect, to show appreciation for that point, because it's a good point. If it's a good point, that is. And then I'll say. Now I have something I'd like to add. So there have times, there have been times actually in the midst of this whole ordeal for several months where I've had to assure medical professionals that I know they care. Um, and they're humans too. <laughs> I think you're a human too. And I think if we see the white doctor's garb or what have you, we tend to think they're not human or they're machines and they're not, they're humans. And I think to show respect, to show care for their their personhood, to call them by name. Hopefully they're calling us by name. I think communication is showing respect and I need to show respect. And even if they're not, let's say showing respect, I need to show them respect. And then hopefully, so that we can get to the point of caring for the patient. I don't care hopefully too much about what they think of me, but care for the patient that we can make sure we're focusing there. So I've had to invest a lot of time at times showing respect for the medical community because some might find that odd, but I think the medical community has felt um, disregarded in the last several years in different contexts. As one professional said to me, people are going to Dr. Google a lot and uh, you know, going to mineral spirits or some other spirits to find their answers and then they impose that on us. And I think to show them appreciation as a patient's family member for the hard work they do to thank them. And I'm not out to spin something and do fake praise. I, I'm not into that kind of thing. But I also want to say to a CNA or to a therapist or to a nurse or a doctor or a nurse practitioner, I appreciate what you've done. And, and that's to whoever. And I don't think that's because you're trying to spin something. You know, that needs to be done. That's part of ethics too, is seeing things accurately. And if I see something good that they're doing, I want to honor it. And then for those who they're not really out to communicate well, just to give you information, honor the information and then turn it back to say, not turn it against them, but to say, okay, now I have a few questions I still need to ask you. And, uh, and if you don't get them answered, find the person who can answer them. And so I just wanted to say that as a patient, I remember, and a lot of times patients, family members and patients themselves are so overwhelmed, it might be hard to get to that point. Um, but I think you'll be surprised. And no, no doubt there are people out there who know this far better than I do and are far more resilient than I am. Uh, they're heroes to me. The loved ones of patients and patients who've gone through life 
life-threatening situations like my sister and brother-in-law losing their second daughter, uh, Hannah, to cancer leukemia many years ago. And, and the sisters, Emily and uh, Megan, just courageous souls. Um, they know this so well. Um, and uh, they're often my teachers, uh, my family's teachers. And so uh, as, as are you, Dr. Potter. So people can easily get defensive if they feel cornered or threatened. Well, now we're coming to the close here. When dealing with critical care situations, tensions abound. Um, it is important to try and de-escalate tensions and guard against inappropriate responses. And I'm speaking to myself here. <laughs> you and I have discussed the importance of healthy and good tone, as well as the need to operate from the vantage point of making and articulating fresh observations and calling for action. Raising concerns like, could you please just in uh, a few minutes here, speak to the importance of tone and fresh observations and communication involving the medical community and those they serve. And, and by the way, I should add this, many who are gonna watch this, they're not medical doctors. Hopefully some are who are medical doctors and uh, experts in the field. I think some in that domain will be watching, but let's say you're not. You can still learn, I think a lot about what you're looking for in a healthcare professional by way of how Dr. Potter has been responding. So take note, this is what I think you should be looking for uh, as you engage the healthcare community. So. Dr. Potter, how would you respond to that last question? The first thing that popped into my mind, Paul, was um, how do I, what's going on inside of me as physician? When I realize that in the middle of a conversation, I'm about to change my mind. Hmm. and realize that um, what I have understood and what I've explained and the direction I want to go in needs some alteration. Perhaps not, you know, giving it up altogether, but it, need, it needs to shift. And um, a technique that I have found useful occasionally was to say to the patient or to the family, um, I have reached a point of uncertainty. Allow me to go um, think this through. And uh, we'll take this up again in 30 minutes or I'll call you again tomorrow morning or whatever the appropriate time sequence might be. I have, I've understood that there are, there are barriers to communication that cannot be overcome in the midst of a conversation, but that the parties need to back away from one another mm -hmm. Apologize for the inconvenience, but to say this, I just feel like this is necessary. I need to be sure I understand myself before I can understand you or communicate myself to you. Hmm. And um, and so I, you know, I'm I'm not confident that that's a, an answer to your question, Paul, but it, go, it goes in the direction that um, I wanted to go in here as we end, that, that, the, that the tone of a conversation needs to be empathic dialogue. And the empathic dialogue of a sense that I understand you and you understand me, if that does not exist, there are all kinds of dangers of misunderstanding in the communication. You just ought to break off the communication and pick it up again another time. That may feel a little radical and, and it's not always possible in every situation, but boy, where, where I have used it, I have found it effective often enough that it ought to be considered. Well, I think it's critically important, and it's what I would call de-escalate 
uh, tensions. Because what I have found is that the more confusion there is, the more tension increases. So if the doctor says, you know, to themselves, I'm a little unclear right now because the situation's murky. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to add to the tension in the room if I try and give an answer too quickly. So we have to hit, in a sense, a word that you called for a few weeks ago, the moral pause. I, I thought you used that language. It's part of the moral pause. And so I think for a patient or uh, from the other side, the, the family member, there are times when I have my emotional uh, tensions intensifying. And you and I've talked about this. I think one should be on high alert in the sense of being alert to the situation, you know, being very caring and careful. But I also have to go carefully, to move carefully, so as not to make haste too quickly, make haste slowly, as an old saying goes. So I think that that's, again, part of morality and ethics is discerning when to speak and to de-escalate based on confusion or because the tension's so high, it's, we're not going to be able to hear one another. Hit the pause button so that we can come back at it and rebuild trust and communication. Dr. Potter, thank you once again for uh, a wonderful conversation on uh, medical ethics. Uh, we took a lot of time here today. We could have gone to Kansas and back again to bring two brothers together, I think, but it was uh, well, worth, well worth the drive here this afternoon. And I wanna thank you uh, for your insights and for wearing probably my favorite tie. I don't know if I've seen that before, but I think that is my favorite tie of yours. Uh, so uh, any closing thoughts you had, sir? I'm just so happy to be here, truly. Well, thank you. Uh, for Dr. Potter and for myself, and I'm also very uh, grateful to be here with him and with you and as <laughs> a musician who I really like, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones would say, uh, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be anywhere, but I'm especially thankful to be here with Dr. Potter and you. Thank you for joining us at New Wine Tastings. Signing off for today. All the best to you. Goodbye.